I just want to find out, Leslie, in terms of what's your background story, man. A young man like yourself doesn't tend to find himself in food production in most walks of life. How, how did you start in this area? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, by background, uh, I've got a degree in food science and technology. Okay. And I've got an MBA in strategic management from the National University of Science and Technology. And I've worked for about six years. Uh, I was head of laboratory, I was a process manager, a production manager, and a product development manager. And uh, well, entrepreneurship to me is not a new thing. It's something that I grew up doing. It's something that I was so passionate about. And um, my venture in this food manufacturing business comes as a passion. Um, so we have tried to introduce very new products that are uh, health conscious because what we believe in is there is the global trend is being skewed in health and wellness okay. whereby health is now regarded as a social value okay. and youthful appearance is also regarded as a status uh, value proposition okay. so we decided let's get into that space and due to the prevalence of non communicable diseases like sugar diabetes uh, cancer, uh, hypertension, okay. to mention just a few, people are actually migrating from junk food to health food, okay. which makes the business a viable entity. Tell us about your setup here. Uh, okay, so this is my office, okay. that's the CEO's office, and then from this end, this is our finance manager's office, and then from that end, that's our operations manager's office. If you okay. check our uh, setup it's an interactive setup okay we believe in sharing ideas we believe in in an open space kind of working environment and we have uh, with us a uh, small uh, uh, young I would say no small but young guys who recently graduated from college okay and then we've got uh, our supply chain guy he's not in he's running around to get things working okay. our marketing guy is just going to list some of the products are uh, in the main retail uh, shops and then we have got our HR who is by the corner there and we have got our accountant who is not also in. They are all out trying to just make sure things are, are running. Okay. Okay. So I think this is pretty much how our administration is structured okay. and we like it this way. Uh, how, how do you find the benefit of having your administration and your operations mm -hmm. in production in one space? No, I think in terms of an integrative uh, approach of doing things, there, there is more coordination okay. in terms of, you know, getting the results. We can easily follow up on each other, we can easily check on each other, okay. we can easily communicate the things that need to be communicated, you okay. know, on time. So it allows us to really nail down on a problem okay. as soon as possible rather than to keep it and then probably wait for it or probably travel to okay. a certain destination to really make having it compact in one place really yes. make it, you know, uh, interactive and, you know, uh, progressive, I would say. So what gave you the confidence to jump ship and go and start out on your own? Because for most people, that's the biggest step. Uh, in terms of leaving a full-time secure job, especially in the economic environment uh, here in Zimbabwe, to actually going out and starting out on your own. What gave you the confidence and talk us through that process? Well, to be honest with you, it's not an easy thing to do. And it takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of bravery, it takes a lot of determination. So what really triggered me, I think they are both push and pull factors. Okay because you would look around the time that I left my job, the macro environment was too volatile. Okay. And where our salaries were quickly deteriorating. Okay. And also, if I also felt that, you know, in a way, people, sugar is now becoming unpopular okay. with a lot of people. People are now using honey as a substitute, okay. you know. So I thought maybe it would be a good idea for me to go and look for what people really want, okay. you know, to really resonate with the desires of the market, okay. you know. So I really wanted a space whereby I can interpret the dynamic customer preferences okay. and convert them into a product. Okay. So this uh, really triggered me, I mean, uh, substantiated by the passion okay. 
although it was not easy, although it's, it, it really took a, 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 a leap of faith okay. to say, I'm going. And, you know, it was not as easy uh, as most people would think it is. Okay. You know, I struggled for about eight months, you know, struggling to actually put food on the table. But because of the determination, because of the hard work, because of the, 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 the faith, the leap of faith that I had sure. that this thing is going to work out, I kept on the foot on the pedal okay. to make things work. So, I mean, where did you start? We all hear the stories of the Steve Jobs and those who started at the back of their garage. I mean, did you start off in your kitchen and how did you amass the initial funds to actually get started and get your product to market? I'll be as honest as possible mm. on that question because I think it's one thing that can really help a lot of young people okay. to make the bold decision of venturing into entrepreneurship. Um, Steve Job was actually better than me because he had a garage. Okay. I did not have a garage <laughs> to start yeah. with. I was a tenant okay. and uh, maybe probably many thanks to my landlord mm. who allowed me to use this veranda. Okay. And many thanks to my wife who allowed me to use a kitchen, a small kitchen, okay. to a, a small cottage kitchen, I would say, okay. to really come up with these formulations and then start commercializing them. So the issue of funding has never been an easy issue, okay. especially in, in such an environment like ours. We used to actually use our house oven to okay. start with, you know, and then when we got our first customer, we then uh, looked for uh, funding. From, I think my brother came through for me with about 50,000 runs to buy a, just a small uh, four tray oven okay. which then improved our output from probably three cases of the cereal per week to about 15 which was actually something that was substantial. So in a way uh, I, would, I would attribute family also played a key role okay. in terms of you know coming in assisting the business and then as we went through the dynamics, you know, the dynamics uh, were very difficult. Okay. Uh, the issue of inflation. Okay. Uh, we were operating in a very hyperinflationary environment, and we then used to get payments sometimes when every dollar was eroded. You know, because we were operating at 30, 60 day payment cycle, and during that period you know whatever that money that you have just invested in the business is all gone away the moment you receive your payment from the supplier there's nothing so we we we, we saw a lot of you know a harsh uh, turbulences from the micro environment but however i think from where i sit and the team that i had we we just told ourselves we need to soldier on we need to manage the dynamics so we we really had uh, very difficult hard times uh, due to the micro environment due to competition due to issues of economies of scale due to issues of pricing uh, quality also you know when you start the issues to do with quality they are very key but what we told ourselves is uh, there is no going back gentlemen there is no uh, we, we can't let go Whatever it is, whatever circumstances, we have to manage. And we really um, impacted that across the guys that, because I think our team was, by then, was pretty much small. Now we are 40, but by then we were still around 10, 12. Yeah, so we really then carried the right attitude. The right attitude was then cascaded to the guys that were there. And probably some of the guys you had to ship out because there was no alignment okay. and those who were aligned to what we wanted to do sure. we stood together and we stood going strong so yeah i would say the yeah, um, things have not been very rosy mm. but i can also assure you that um as you can see um, I, I got the uh, second runner of the business of the year at national award level which is a well, congratulations a, 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 yeah, yeah yeah which is a big sign that um, we, we are trying our best, we are trying our best and the issue of funding um, it has not been a very good issue to talk about. Okay. Why? Because I think the biggest problem that we have, small guys like us normally attract small micro uh, finance uh, and the interest rate normally at microfinance level is about 15 to 17 percent. 
per month, yeah, which is very high. Uh, but we, because we are left with no option, we have to go that route. Okay. And normally, most of the business, that's where they fail. Because what then happens is probably they fail to make the repayments. Why? Because the interest rates are just too high. Um, with the normal banking system, I think the biggest issue that I've seen over my working experience is the issue of uh, political. Because from young people, definitely at, for, from a 25-year-old entrepreneur, or even a 31-year-old entrepreneur, you wouldn't expect much collateral from that person because probably someone who is just pro probably coming from college after graduating and he doesn't own a house. Mm -hmm. So the banking institutions don't really, uh, are not assisting in a way, yeah, especially when you don't have the collateral to substantiate the, 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 your request. Um, even if the business is a going concern, even if they are confirmed orders, I think there is a gap that comes. I think uh, my, my conviction now is you can't make it without collateral. You okay. can't get finance without collateral. And I think it's something that really has to uh, get into the attention of the government okay. and all relevant stakeholders to say, no, no, no. Um, we don't all come from stable backgrounds where parents have houses or where you can quickly get a house, okay. but you might have a viable business. Yes. Why don't the government or the, the financial institution hedge the business? Mm. Because it's a business on its own, it's a legal entity, it's a going concern. It has got assets, mm. it has got, I mean, immovable, movable properties. They can use that to probably get their securities, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's one area that really needs improvement, especially when it comes to Zimbabwean mm -hmm. uh, banking institutions or the business in Zimbabwe. So because, I mean, from where I sit, I can assure you that our products now have got a regional reach. Okay. You know, there's no product acceptance in the region. Um, and even in the local market. Sure. But as we speak, we are actually struggling with really capacitating the business to where it's supposed to be. Uh, currently, our output is at 25% vis-a-vis the demands of the market. And that is a problem on, the, on its own, because at 25% really, there is a lot of risk that are associated with operating at that level. One, the, easy, the risk of actually closing okay. down is actually there. And the risk of actually getting people with more money overtaking the idea okay. is there. So I think we need a lot of support when it comes to financing our Absolutely. business model. Because, you know, yes, growing organic is okay. Yes. But to some extent, yes. like the stage at which I am now, mm. I have the market, I have the product, yes. I have the range. But what is now the missing link is the capacity to substantiate the requirements of the market. So, I mean, let's talk about uh, the, the products that you have. I can yeah. see you've got a great number of, uh, of items in front of us. Just talk us through in terms of your product range, okay. what you currently have, what is the most popular items and the high demand. Uh, and then we can also maybe go into who are your customers and the reach that you currently have. Okay. So, I think um, we... We, uh, our, 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 our range is now not very big, but now okay, I, I would say. We've got what we call granola cereals. Okay. Uh, granola cereals, they come in the three different flavors. There's this one, the original, there's this one, the fruity one, and there's this one, the honey one. If you look at how we have structured them, you will see that the fruity one, you have got uh, fruits in them. Uh, and it is made of road oats, uh, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, flax seeds, all the healthy seeds are in that formulation and it tastes very well. And then this, the honey one, we also take care of the people that no longer want to use sugar in their formulations. So we have used pure honey on this one. And this one is very popular with people, uh, diabetic people, people with, uh, you know, underlying uh, uh, um, uh, diseases, I would say. Um, and we have the, uh, the Otis. I think this one is a new formulation. We recently launched it, um, I think, two, three months ago. But now this is like the most popular of all the products that we have. Uh, because I think this one is because it has pumpkin seed, 
they are cookies, but they are, we call them oats because they have got high fiber. Okay. And they have got uh, nuts in them, and this one we've got pumpkin seeds in them, and this one we call it the original. I think what makes them unique is there is very low sugar in them. Okay. There is very low sugar. And then, uh, as we speak, today we have actually commercialized the dried fruits, the raisins, and we have also commercialized the raw pots. So these are some of the products. I think what we have, we, we can proud our business on is the continuous uh, development aspect. Okay. You know, we, we don't settle for less. Okay. We always keep pushing ourselves to really get things uh, going and for us to be competitive. And I think we also have pure honey, uh, pure honey which is bottled in two different ways, the, for the up market and for the mass market. Um, so the range, the reason why we are growing our range is pretty much I would call ourselves offenders. Okay. Why? Because the cereal category, as we traditionally know, is a category that is saturated by big brands. Yes. You know, you've got your Kellogg's there, you've got your Nestle there, yes. you've got your Bocomo there. You know, very big brands, massive brands in sure. there. So we go there, we offend. Okay. We, we, we offend through the way, if you check on our packaging, mm -hmm. we also want to leverage a, 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 a height higher than what is in existence. Mm -hmm. And also our pricing, we make sure it's lower. So we're offering high quality at low cost. And if you look at, you know, the Otis, the Otis range, they are also very big guys in the uh, confectionery industry. But we also get in there, we offend using the same, using the same uh, uh, principle. Okay. And if you look at, you know, business around Southern Africa, there is a bit of monopoly okay. around the FMCG. Uh, only a few people know about it, but it's in existence. If you look at the Zimbabwean system, it's well saturated by INSCO. Okay. INSCO is everywhere. If you go to Zambia, Trade Kings is everywhere. The same South Africa, there's a big guy who is also everywhere. So this is like the nature of how things are structured in Southern Africa, okay. which then leaves us the black small entrepreneurs with a very little okay. uh, space to compete on. So the best way to do it is then go in if it is importation, because some most of the products in here are imported products, yes. we, we go on an import substitution drive. Okay. You go on an offensive drive on each and every category so that you get, if you're getting 0.5% of the market share there, you get 1%. At the end of the day, you become, you have the muscle that you require and then compete head to head with this big guy. So it's all about playing around strategies okay. and probably trying to find a way of, you know, surviving so um i mean tell us in terms of how much of an how much output you have out there in the market in terms of uh, tonnage per month or, or, or per year okay so this is what is on the ground um what we do pretty much is around 24 tons okay yeah in a month combined all lines combined okay. so this is what needs to go to the market today so this is where we place all the orders that need to go to the market so we have got a very huge customer base. Uh, we service food lovers markets. Uh, we service OKs. We do spas. We do TMP can pays. We do Fazak. We do greens. We do enrichers. You know, so our customer base is very big. Okay. But uh, in terms of what the market requires from us, like I told you. Yes. We are just doing 25% of what's required by the market. I understand. Yeah. So this is probably, we, we are trying to rectify it. We are trying okay. to run around to see, to make sure everything really gets fixed. So as we speak, we have got equipment that is being fabricated okay. to really step up in terms of production, to really step up in terms of operations, to really get the output there so that we meet the demand that we have created in the market. Okay, great. So what about in terms of export market? You talked about a lot of uh, the local players that yes. you are supplying to. Yes. Uh, how are you managing to reach into the export market? Export market, as we speak, we have got a confirmed order to Zambia okay. of our cereal of about 30 tons. Okay. And we actually, the reason why we are beefing up our equipment is also to try and start servicing the export market. Okay. Because actually, that's where I feel that's where most of our potential is because of the liquidity of the market, because of the disposable income of the, of the uh, customer base, sure. and because of, you know, 
they, they are not depressed economy like us. Okay. So they appreciate more of our products than in our own on, on country. So export is really big for us. It's really something that we are working on. It's something that we really want to change uh, uh, into, and we have also we have already uh, uh, received a confirmed order. So let's finish up and talk about the future. What does the future hold for this company? What is the big dream and the big goal that you have and that you're chasing? Uh, well, I would be honest with you. Um, my inspiration actually comes from very big brands. Okay. Uh, when I look at Nestle, I see myself mm. uh, in that category one day. Okay. When I look at Kellogg's, I also see myself in that category one day. So when even the way we do our things, the way we structure the policies that we have, mm. the systems that we are putting in place, mm. the drive that we have, we actually want to create a global brand. Okay. A brand that can compete at a global level, not just at local or regional level. So we are working towards that. It's okay. something that we really want. We really want to stamp our feet on the ground to really command okay. authority in the market. And we know what needs to be done, and okay. we are going to do it. Okay. So this is our conviction, this is what we believe in, and this is what we are going to do as a business. Great stuff. There you have it. It's an amazing story uh, of a startup in here, here in Harare, tackling the food market, specifically the cereal sector. And I'm really inspired by the product range and the development and progress they've made in spite of all the challenges. So it shows you that if you have the right mindset and you have the right product, anything is possible. Thank you very much for talking to me today and I'm looking forward to hearing more of your growth and your development. Thank you so much. Okay, great stuff. Yeah.